right, and we are back. All 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 right, and we are back. Right, and we are back and today we're back with another reaction video this time we're gonna be reacting to a video from the incredible useful charts Yay! Look, I have a useful chart it's so useful it's also a chart uh, but guys uh, we're back uh, the useful charts has a video for the Buddhist denominations and this is gonna be incredible guys now I I do have a feeling this is gonna say that we're going to put denominations in quotes here. I feel like he's going to go on some, like they don't actually have denominations type of thing, but you know, he, he got to keep, got to keep the playlist in order, you know? So guys, <laughs> with that being said, make sure that you like comment and subscribe to Matt Baker and the useful charts crew themselves. Uh, if you're not familiar with them, I don't know how, I don't even know how you found this video. If you don't know about useful charts, but you know, if you haven't, go check them out. They're incredible. They make great content. They make great charts. They're very useful. Uh, also, guys, did you know that I have a merch store? <gasps> wow. Look at this. Look at this merch. Wouldn't you want to be rocking around with this merch? You know, you can take a look. It's all nice. It's a great merch, guys. It's got another one on the back. It's incredible, guys. Uh, so with that being said, make sure you check out the merch store but also like comment subscribe to this channel because you know you never know what i'm gonna be doing next i could be doing this i could be doing that you, you never know when a movie reaction is gonna be coming out yeah, yeah, yeah it's some fun stuff guys uh so with that being said make sure you like comment and subscribe because here's the serious part if you don't subscribe comment like the videos youtube will come through that door and they will. Useful charts. Buddhist denominations explain. Hi, this is Matt Baker. So far on this channel, I've talked about Christian denominations as yep. well as Jewish, Muslim, and I remember Hindu that. denominations. I remember all of those, guys. I, I did all of those. If you haven't seen them, check out all the videos that I've done of these four major religions here. Incredible videos. Check them out. All you got to do is is go into the, uh, I think I have like a playlist there. Check out the playlist and, you know, watch the playlist. I'm good at this YouTube stuff, guys. So you probably already guessed that Buddhist denominations would be next. I now, remember, I'm using the word denomination quite loosely here, mm -hmm, simply mm -hmm. to mean a branch or sect within a larger religion. So let's start with the Vedic religion which I introduced in my Hinduism video. It developed in India around 1500 BCE, after a group of Indo-Europeans slowly migrated into the area, probably intermingling with the descendants of the once mighty Indus Valley civilization, as well as with other native Indians living along the Ganges River. The Vedic religion likely borrowed elements from all three of these groups, which is an important point to remember. We call this early form of Hinduism Vedic because it was during this period that the oldest and most sacred Hindu scriptures called the Vedas were composed. How I remember that. The Vedas, there's a lot of them. They're pretty good. From what I've been hearing from you guys and from the little bit of research I have done on my own, they're pretty good. You know, there's a lot of great things. I like the different version, like the different ways they do it. Uh, you know, I, I just like that there's a lesson for everything in there. There's a, there's a, it's just a bunch of, it's a lot of experiences. It's a lot of good things in there. I like it. I like the Vedas, guys. However, by around 500 BCE, the Vedic religion had evolved into Brahmanism, in which a certain class of people known as Brahmins controlled the priesthood, as well as many other aspects of society. Below them were the Kshatriya, consisting of secular rulers and warriors the Vaishya, the farmers and merchants, and finally, the Shudra, laborers and servants. 
However, not everyone was happy with the authority of the Brahmins and with the teachings of the Vedas. Mm. This gave rise to the Shramana movement, which was particularly popular along the eastern Gangetic Plain. Really? In order to explain, let's take a look at a map of India around 500 BCE. All right, guys, if you are from India, which place is closest to you? Comment down below which area is closest to you. Uh, whoever has the most comments saying they're from around that area. Uh, I may possibly do something in the future. By this point, most of the North was divided into 16 independent states, which were known as Mahajanapadas, meaning great realms. Brahmanism was strongest in the kingdom of Kuru. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What did he say? To 16 independent states, which were known as Mahajanapadas. Ma Mahajanapadas? Did I say that right? Mahajanapadas? Meaning Look great. at me. Look at me, guys. Look at me. This is why you guys show up here. This is why you subscribe. This is what you're here for. Mahapanajanas. I, I did not say it right that time. All right, guys. You, did, you don't subscribe for this. Realms. Brahmanism was strongest in the kingdom of Kuru, which had previously been much larger and was the setting for the great Hindu epic, the Mahabharat. But to the east, there were other states like Kosala, Vrji and Magadha, where support for the Brahmins was weaker. It was here that the Shramana movement took hold. Okay. Basically, a Shramana was a person who dropped out of everyday society in order to instead live a very simple life focused mm. on spiritual development. Okay. This resulted in the development of... That'd be me. I'd be like, man, forget all this. I'm, I'm getting a simple life. I, all I need is internet access. Uh, a constant supply of like groceries or food or something, uh, maybe like money and stuff, a couple of people around, you know, I don't want to go completely crazy. Um, and then like I do kind of like, you know, neighbors and stuff sometimes. So like maybe a couple of neighbors as well. You know, that would be me. I'd be that except with a few added benefit like I, I would need a few things from the city like let's 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 not be like completely false here I, I couldn't be just like completely out in the woods but i do love the idea of several new schools of philosophy but it also ended up influencing brahmanism as well leading to what's been called the hindu synthesis which mm. is when what we know today as hinduism really took shape Okay. So from this point forward, from the Hindu perspective, Indian schools of philosophy were now divided into two categories, Astika and Nastika. Astika schools accept the authority of the Vedas and are hence considered to be a part of Hinduism, okay. whereas the Nastika schools reject the Vedas and are some thus considered is, to be separate religions. Some of this is coming back, it's coming back to me now. I feel like we already went over Nastikas before, but like, let's see what he got to say. The two Gnostica schools that most people are familiar with today are Jainism and Buddhism. But in earlier times, there were other schools of thought that were just as popular. These include the atheist Charvaka school, the agnostic Ajnana school, and the fatalistic Ajivika school. Okay, with that background, let's now focus exclusively on Buddhism. Let's Unlike get to Hinduism, it. which has no founder, Buddhism does. It was founded by the person who most people simply know as the Buddha. But this was not his actual name. At birth, he was called Siddhartha Gautama, and he was a prince living within the kingdom of Kosala. Okay. More specifically, he belonged to a region and ethnic group within Kosala known as the Shakyas, whose territory actually fell within what we today call Nepal. This is why in mm. the earliest records, the Buddha is called Shakyamuni, meaning the sage of the Shakyas. Okay, that explains. So is, that's why Nepal, uh, that's where they have, isn't that where the, uh, you know, they have all those, like the monks and stuff? Like that's that, that's where they are, right? If you're from Nepal, let me know. If, if anybody here is watching from or near Nepal, shout outs to you, you know, from me to you, you know, grab the merch. Grab the merch. I would love to see the merch in Nepal, guys. Let's get that out there. You know, let's let's do it. 
<laughs> let's <laughs> you know, let's do this for Buddhism, guys. <laughs> Don't. Okay, guys, that that may have been ridiculous. I won't go through his full story, but here are the highlights. At the age of 29, Siddhartha left his family and life of luxury to become a shramana. At okay. first, he practiced asceticism, denying himself all but the smallest amount of food needed oh, wow. to survive. But then, is that? I don't. That that's crazy, guys. I don't know how healthy that is for you, but I'm sure it's. I'm sure it's uh, extreme on your mental, you know, like the fortitude to be able to do that has got to be incredible. You know, you can't just be like, oh, I don't have any, you know, you got to have a lot of willpower to be like, I'm just pretty much starve myself, but not to death. But also I'm just going to relax and be chill the whole time about it. Like, man, and if he didn't have an attitude on top of that while he was hungry the whole time then extra shout outs to him. Cause I know I would have a huge attitude. Like don't even talk to me, bro. I'm not even talking to nobody right now. I'm hungry. I can't like, I can't, I can't yap when I'm hung, when I'm hungry, you know? And at the age of 35, while sitting under a tree, he is said to have achieved enlightenment. It's at this point that he became the Buddha, which is a title meaning the enlightened one. After this, he preached about the middle way, which promotes living in between the extremes of overindulgence on one side and self-denial on the other side. He also laid the foundations for Buddhist thought, called Dharma, which can be okay. summed up by the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. Oh! Now, wow. in this video, I'm not going to go through the Buddha's teaching in detail. So, I oh, hold on. Let's let's go through this though. Let's let's go the four noble truths, guys. Truth number one: Life is full of suffering. Whoa! <laughs> should have I should have pre-read these before I just like read them out. But like, life is full of suffering. That is a rule number one: the four noble truths. That is a guys. People don't like to say this, but life does have a lot of misery in it. Trust me has a lot of it. You have some good times. I know it's all it's all super funny games on the on the stream when you're watching it and stuff. You're watching the videos. You're like, "Oh my gosh. It's so freaking happy all the time." You guys don't see the suffering. You don't see the pain behind the the YouTube stuff. But yes, uh suffering is caused by craving. I guess so. Uh suffering can be stopped by stopping craving. That is a interesting perspective. Craving is stopped by following the eightfold path. Now, the eightfold path, let's see. So, we, we established life sucks. It sucks because there are cravings in life. If you want it to stop sucking, you gotta, you know, stop all the cravings and the only way to stop the cravings is to follow this eight path now the right uh what is this right sadamati right view right resolve right speech right conduct right livelihood right effort right mindfulness okay i so you just have to have the right attitude towards things is what i'm really seeing here you got to you got to be more what like optimistic in your viewpoint. I know he's not going to go over it in detail, but like this sounds like you just got to be like, all right, let me have the right. I don't know what the Sadarmati is, but I'm assuming that's more like the. I'm going to take a wild guess and say that's like a spirit. The right view, I'm guessing it's just like, all right, make sure you're looking at things the right way. You're resolving things properly. You're saying the right things. You're doing the right things. You're living the right way. You're actually giving the correct amount of effort. You're giving the, you're putting your effort towards the correct things in life. You're being mindful of the things you do, which kind of goes back under conduct and resolve, uh, as well as view. Uh, and then it all circles around. Just keep doing that. And you will no longer be suffering all the time because your head, it won't be in your head. You'll be like, suffering? What? This fire that I'm in, it was, it's the winter. I'm cold. This, this is a great fire. 
I wanted this. I wanted warmth. This is what I asked for. This is more like, uh, this is kind of like, um, always just like staying positive, you know, or maybe I'm completely wrong. We'll see later. Now in this video, I'm not going to go through the Buddha's teaching in detail. So instead I'm going to recommend to you a few books. In fact, thanks to today's sponsor. All right, guys. Is it? I think it's that time. We're just going to judge a book by its cover right now. I know they say don't ever do that, but let's see. These books all look pretty interesting. Which book do you guys believe would give me the most amount of teachings? The Heart of Buddhist Teachings? Buddhism, plain and simple. I kind of like that one. I like the eye. It's really drawn me in. The Four Noble Truths of Love. I don't know, because this seems more like relationship advice. Uh, radical acceptance, embracing your life with the heart of Buddhism. I, for some reason, this one's coming off a little gimmicky to me. The Art of Happiness. Uh, okay. I kind of like this one. This one's the Dalai Lama. You know, I hear he's got some big pool out there. Uh, no self, no problem. Mm. How neuroscience is catching up with Buddhism. Ooh, a PhD. Somebody with a PhD is writing this. I don't know. I feel like this one here is my number one. This one looks cool. And I kind of, you know, it, it is just plain and simple. It's, it's, it's right there. Then I would go the art of happiness. Then I would go no self, no problem. Then the art of Buddhist teachings radical acceptance and then the four noble truths of love that's just the order if i was going to read these books maybe i should read these books guys let me know in the comments if you want to do a live stream with these book one of these books in mind you know we can do a reading together or maybe you just want me to read it and then report back to you how i feel about it i don't know guys i don't know blinkist I'm going to offer you free access to all of them. Whoa. All you have to do is sign up for a seven day free trial of Blinkist using the link in the description. Guys, you see this? You see Blinkist? Do you see, do you see, have you been blinking? I pray you have not because you would have missed the opportunity to get seven days free. This is a book service. This is like online reading. You get to read books and I want to make sure you can. All you got to do is follow Currently, the link. I've been listening to no what has self, he been listening to? no problem. He was, he chose no self, no problem. That was number three on my list. It was number one on his, you know, I was close. You guys in the comments who commented, no self, no problem. You were right. Everyone who picked my choice, you were also right. Uh, people who picked the Four Noble Truths of Love, unfortunately, you were wrong. It was the subtitle that caught my eye, how neuropsychology is catching up to Buddhism. I see. I see. I, I see we got him. You know what? From what I know of Matt Baker, this makes sense. Now, I don't know him at all personally. But I've watched a couple of his videos now. I feel like I know him enough to say he would have chose that one. Now, I can't say that now because he already said it. But you guys know that I was thinking it and because you guys watch my videos and you know me. Now, remember, you can get access <laughs> you to see how it works? these books by signing up for a free trial. You can even use their new spaces feature to share these titles with your friends. Whoa. All members of a shared space can access all titles in the space with or without what? a Blinkist premium subscription. Guys, we could be in spaces together. We could be in a space. It's like uh, it's like being on YouTube, but in a different platform. Uh, speaking of which, I do have a you know Instagram page. You can follow me there. Uh, I think I'm on uh, TikTok. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm on I'm on Twitter or X as they call it now. Uh, I have a Patreon. I sell shirts. Look at the merch. I sell those. 
Link in the description. But speaking of which, Blinkist is now offering but, yeah. Useful Charts viewers 40% off their annual oh. premium membership. Oh my so gosh. If you want to get a seven day free trial and then 40 Seven days. Off, just use the special. And so a free trial. Link. Seven in, in days the- and a free trial. Seven days of a free trial and 40% off is what I meant to say the last two times. The description or pinned comment. Okay, back to the family of Buddhist denominations. During the Buddha's lifetime, he not only taught the Dharma, he also built up a community of followers known as the Sangha. You may have heard Buddhists refer to the Triple Gem or Three Jewels. Never heard this of it. This is a reference to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Oh, it's like, it's kind of like the, it's like a similar idea to the Holy Trinity. It's not the same for anybody who's going to be like, oh, you can't compare the two. You can't compare the two. I am not. I'm saying, I guess technically I, I am a little bit. They, they, there's some similarities only in the fact that there's three, three entities. It's slightly different. Leave me alone. According to tradition, the Buddha died at age 80 around the year 480 BCE. At this point, the first Buddhist council was held with 500 of his followers attending. The purpose Mm. was to make sure that all of the teachings of the Buddha and the rules for the community were remembered. One of his 10 core disciples named Ananda recited all of the teachings, which are known as sutras. And another disciple named Upali recited the community rules, which are known as Vinaya. According to tradition, a second Buddhist council was held approximately 100 years after the Buddha's death. This time, there were disagreements over the community rules, and this led to the first Buddhist schism. The majority group became known Jeez. as the Mahasangaka, meaning... Why does this always happen? Can people go 100 years without a split in their like beliefs? Like you got you you've all been following the same path for so long. It is so funny to me how we as people just always find a way for these schisms to happen. I am waiting for the video where they don't have a schism. I highly doubt it will happen, but it's probably going to be like who has the least amount of schisms is going to be like the the big thing going forward because like it's impossible to not disagree about something major to the point where now you have to become a whole different set of people instead of just being like you know what we could just be the same and i just disagree on that one thing no we got to split it up this thing is this one thing is too major it's it's too much. We we gotta split it up, guys. We got a disagreement about this one thing, and I don't feel like resolving it with you. So, boom, whole nother set. Now we got a schism. The Great Sangha and the minority group became known as the Stataviravada, meaning School of the Elders, because it consisted mostly of the more senior monks. Take note mm. that all of the modern branches of Buddhism descend from the Staviravada. Although there is some debate over whether or not the Mahasangaka had an influence on the development of Mahayana, a term that I will explain in a bit. But back to early Buddhism. Eventually, more and more divisions occurred, to the point where in ancient times, it is thought that there were at least 18 separate schools. Around the time of Ashoka, the great Indian emperor who united most of India for the very first time, the three main ones were the Vibhajivada, Sarvastivada, and Pudgalavada. Ashoka is an extremely important figure in the history of early Buddhism because he himself converted to the new religion and promoted missionary efforts to spread Buddhism to other lands. The most important of these... Hey, he did a good job. It's, it's everywhere. You see, I feel like there's a Buddhist in just about every country in the world now. I'm like, shout outs to you, uh, missionary man. You did it. Asko, Asa, As- Ashoka, I believed in you the whole time. Missions was led by his firstborn son, Mahinda, who became a monk and brought Buddhism to Sri Lanka. Ooh. Now, I should point out that one does not need to become a monk to follow Buddhism, although some still do, as it is generally seen as being a faster way to reach enlightenment. 
in Sri Lanka. Guys, can we just admit it's about the journey and not the destination? You know, getting enlightenment is cool, but the path up to enlightenment, that's where you meet all your friends, you know, part of the cards. The school founded by Mahinda became known as the Tamrashatya school, and it was a branch of the Vibhajyavada school. It was in Sri Lanka that the Pali Canon was produced which today is the oldest surviving complete set of Buddhist scriptures. Wow. Take note that Pali is a language closely related to, but not quite the same as, Sanskrit. Let's now take a moment to look at the contents of the Pali Canon. A full set of Buddhist scriptures is called a Tripitaka, which means three baskets. That's because it's comprised of three main parts. The Vinaya Pitaka, which contains the community rules, the Sutra Pitaka, which contains the Buddha's teachings, and the okay. Abhidhamma, which contains analysis of those teachings. The Vinaya Pitaka contains rules for both male monks, who are called bhikkhus, as well as for female monks or nuns, who are called bhikkhunis. Why have I not seen female monks before? Can, can you, can you, whoever's watching this, why have I not seen female monks? Are they rare? Do they just not happen as much? Are they not publicized? Like, I feel like I've only seen male monks. This is this is crazy. I, where are they? What? Why did, you know, why did that blow my mind? Why is that so interesting to me? Like, I've, I've genuinely never like seeing a female monk and honestly it got to the point i've never even thought about it before i've never even questioned it i just figured you know what a lot of dudes like being monks you know it's it's just one of those things maybe they don't let girls in or something turns out they do i just hadn't seen them i'm ignorant i'm sorry if you are a female monk and you're watching this i personally apologize to you i didn't know you existed also contains a few sections covering early Buddhist history. In the Pali Canon, the Sutra Pitaka is divided into five parts called okay. Nikayas, meaning volumes. These can then be broken down further into smaller books. Of these smaller books, the one that I'd like to highlight is the Dharmapada, which is located in the fifth Nikaya. It's the most well-known of all the Buddhist scriptures. Why? And it's a good starting point for those who want to dip their feet in the water. Okay. Finally, I'd like to point out that the Pali Canon version of the Abhidhamma has seven parts. Okay, let's now go back to the family tree chart. From Sri Lanka, Buddhism eventually spread to Burma, Thailand, Laos, and Cambodia. The type of Buddhism found in all of these countries is therefore very similar. Nowadays, it is called Theravada Buddhism. Take note that the word Theravada is actually just the Pali version of the Sanskrit word Staviravada, which, as you might remember, means school of the elders. Theravada mm. Buddhism therefore sees itself as the original Buddhism. Generally speaking, it is more strict and more earthly focused than the other forms of Buddhism. Although you can see here that there are three main types of Buddhism in the world today, Considering that Tibetan Buddhism is, relatively speaking, quite small, it is often said that there are really just two main types of Buddhism, Theravada and Mahayana. I'm therefore going to focus on Mahayana. Hold on. I, f I would have thought he would have said the only two were the Tibetan and the Theravada. This, that's actually a surprise because I've, I feel like I've only, I haven't seen the East Asian uh, Mahayana, I haven't seen you guys before, so I'm sorry. Again, if you are part of the East Asian uh, Mahayana group and I am currently mispronouncing how to say your name properly, I personally apologize to you. I figured it was the Theravada and then Tibetan. That's literally, those are the two, those are the two big ones that I know of. Everyone else, shout outs to you. What's going on, Tibetan Buddhists? You know, you gotta, 
you got to do the thing, guys. You got you, you got to step it up a little bit. Next, the exact origins of Mahayana are unclear. It wasn't really a separate school, but rather a movement that took place <laughs> within many schools. One theory is that it developed out of the now extinct Mahasangika school, but another is that it might have originated among lay people, meaning non-monks. Whatever the origin, the common factor among Mahayana Buddhists is that they have an additional set of scriptures known as the Mahayana Sutras. Okay. According to Mahayana Buddhism, these special sutras were initially hidden away after the Buddha's death, only to be revealed later when the time was right. One of the early schools to accept the Mahayana Sutras was the Dharma Guptaka school, which was originally centered in Gandhara in what is today Pakistan and Afghanistan. This is why there were, until very recently, some very old Buddha statues in this region. Unfortunately, these were destroyed by the Taliban in 2001. What? There is some debate over- Guys, that's messed up. That's, that's pretty messed up, guys, you know? Whether the Dharma Guptaka school came out of the Vibhajavada school, or whether it came out of the Sarvastivada school. I've therefore showed it coming from both. From okay. the Gandhara region, the Dharma Guptaka school eventually spread to China, Korea, Japan, and Vietnam. There were other schools that spread to these areas as well, but they all went extinct. And therefore today, all East Asian Mahayana monks follow the Dharma Guptaka community rules. Strangely, oh, wow. although Buddhism originated in India and was once a dominant force there, today the vast majority of Buddhists now live outside of India. In fact, it is now China that has the most amount of Buddhists in the world. I therefore want to talk a bit about the Chinese canon, which is the main alternative to the Pali canon. Like the Pali canon, it too contains a Tripitaka. However, take note that the sections covering the teachings of the Buddha are called Agamas instead of Nikayas. The Chinese canon has only four Agamas, which roughly correspond to the first four Nikayas from the Pali canon. Okay. The Vinaya and Abu Dharma sections, however, are totally different. Whereas the Pali canon includes the Theravada community rules, the Chinese canon includes the Dharma Guptaka rules as well as rules from several now extinct schools. However, the main difference between the Pali Canon and the Chinese Canon is that the Chinese Canon includes several additional sections, most notably the Mahayana Sutras, which I mentioned earlier. There are many of these, but the most important are the Lotus Sutra, the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra, the Flower Garland Sutra, and the Nirvana Sutra. But that's not all. The Chinese canon also includes a section called the Jataka, which describes Buddha's birth story, and a section about Tantras, which are esoteric or more secret practices meant only for those with specialized knowledge. Wow. Now, as you might have guessed, the Chinese canon is mostly written in Chinese, classical awesome. Chinese to be exact, although the Japanese version does include some parts in Japanese. This is why the Pali Canon is generally understood to be the older of the two canons. After all, Pali is an ancient Indian language, and India is where Buddhism originated. Yeah. However, this paints a bit of a wrong picture. It's actually more accurate to say that the Pali Canon is the oldest, complete version of the Buddhist scriptures. This is because there are, in fact, parts of the Chinese Canon for which we do have the corresponding, much older, Sanskrit versions. It's just that we don't have the complete Chinese canon available in Sanskrit. Mm. Okay, now... So the Chinese one might be... Some parts of it may be more accurate. Some parts, possibly. Because they're older. They may be, you know, from somebody close to them. Who knows? Who knows? I'm not the guy. I'm not, I'm not him. Who knows? I'm just saying, throw it out there. The, the possibility, we don't know which canon is actually canon. Which one of these is non-canon? That's, the, that's the real question we should be asking each other. You know, which one of these is Dragon Ball Z and which one of these is Dragon Ball GT? That's all I'm saying. GT is no longer canon. 
I just want to know which one of these are GT. The complete Chinese canon available in Sanskrit. Okay, now before I move on, I want to briefly describe the main difference between Theravada Buddhism and Mahayana Buddhism Please. in terms of beliefs. In both cases, the ultimate goal is to achieve enlightenment, which then frees a person from the continuous cycle of birth, death, and rebirth, which, by the way, is also the goal in Hinduism. Theravada yeah. Buddhists teach that there are three paths to enlightenment. Okay. The first, and by far the most common path, is the student path in which a person learns from the teachings of a Buddha and eventually becomes an arhat, mostly by means of strict discipline. Once a person becomes an arhat, they will no longer be reborn. The second path is that of the solitary Buddha, in which a person achieves enlightenment on their own, but is unable to teach others how to do it. Mm, I like that middle one. I like this solitary path. It's the pull your bootstraps up path you know pull yourself by your own bootstraps do it yourself you don't need nobody else you are a strong independent woman you don't need no man telling you how to become a buddhist or however they say it in here you are enough you know you want to get enlightenment enlighten yourself that's you know or you can be a student and have somebody else teach you how to be an enlightened person you know this is those are the two paths so far. If I was going to choose a path, it's the solidarity one. You know, the solidarity one. I would be all like, oh, man, look at me. I'm uh, so enlightened today. I'm, I, I did some stuff. Boom. I'm him. That that, But that would just be me. You know, for you guys, I would recommend, you know, for some of you guys, I would recommend the student paths. There's some of you guys out there, I know, you guys are also with me. You're solidary, you know, you're getting the Buddha path. You're All you need to do is, uh, you know, a couple of days alone, boom, you're you're there, you know. But some of you guys, you're definitely more a student path. I'm sorry to tell you this, you know. I still love you. You would be my student, and I would teach you the path. But some of you would 100% be student path. Let's see what the third option is, because I know there's a path for the third option, you know, for the one third of you guys who don't have a path right now let's figure what it out finally there is the full buddha path full. in which person achieves enlightenment on their own and is also able to teach others how to oh uh, i'm sorry this i'm sorry i'm sorry 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 guys this would be my path i would be the full buddha path actually because i would be able to teach you guys i would be i would be able to like make sure you knew as soon as i figured it out all i'd be like it's like boom i figured it out you know i haven't really put that effort forth so far but once i do it's like boom i got the light behind me i'm enlightened and then i'm showing you guys how to do it cuz you you would be my students but i would you know so like i'm path 3 and a lot of you guys are path one, but then I know there's a couple of you out there. Y'all are path two, but I also know there's a few of you out there who's able to go to path three. You know, I know some of you are also like me. You could do path three, but a lot of you guys are path one. Let's, let's be real here. So a lot of you guys are going to be students of the game here and nothing wrong with that. you be in a gym. you be doing your thing. You're a student of the game you know we're out there learning doing the thing dribble 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 you know i'm i don't know why this is turning into a basketball reference but it is you know it, it is how it is you know i would lead you guys on the correct path i i wouldn't you know lead you astray i'm here for you easily was the path taken by siddhartha gotama which is why he is called the buddha now, yep. what a lot of non-Buddhists don't know is that the Buddha was not the only person to achieve full Buddhahood. The Pali Canon mentions 27 Buddhas by name, Buddhas who lived before the Buddha. The three mm. most recent being Kakusanda, Konagamana, and Kasaba. It also talks about a future Buddha named Maitreya, which brings me to the word Bodhisattva, which is... Wait, they know his name? Uh, so, 
like I feel like you're already at an advantage if you just are named Matreya. Like, I, I, is that like a is that like a title? Because if that's just his, if they're saying like, yo, his name is gonna be this, and if I was somebody who followed that religion, I would name my kid that because it's like, yo, you never know. You you never know, you know. Except I would know because if I had a kid and was Buddhist, and I would name him that because he would be that. But only because I myself would have taken the full Buddha path and become, you know, it's a whole thing. There's a reason why I know, but I'm just saying there is. It does feel a, a, a little bit like, like I don't know if you should know the name already, right? I just feel like that's already going to be a huge advantage to everyone who's named that. Unless here's the tricky part. Now here's, here's where they get you. What if that's his middle name or last name? You don't know. Maybe that is only a first name option, but at the same time, we don't know. We got middle names now. I don't know if they had middle names way back then. You know, I'm pretty sure that just came around like, you know, within the last few hundred years, people started doing middle names. Guys, if you are Buddhist and you have children, here's a here's a uh, a quick trick. Most Buddhists don't want you to hear. <laughs> Name your kid Matreya. Uh, you never know. It's like just playing the lotto. You don't win every time, but you at least put your number in. At least you 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 were part of it. You know, that's what I would say. Maybe I'm wrong. But try it out. Is a term that is used to refer to someone on the path towards becoming a full Buddha. In Theravada Buddhism, bodhisattvas are thought to be rare, with Maitreya being the only current one. Like I say, in Theravada Buddhism, most people take the Arhat path. And this is where Mahayana Buddhism is very different. In Mahayana Buddhism, the first two paths are viewed as being very much inferior. Yeah. This is why Mahayana Buddhists refer to Theravada as Hinayana, which means the lesser path. In contrast, mm. the word Mahayana means the greater path. Mm. Mahayana teaches that the full Buddha path. Guys, I don't want to just call you guys uh, Hinayatas like that, you know? I don't want to just disrespect you guys like that, saying you're on the lesser path. Let's just say it's a different path than the path that, you know, certain people like myself would be taking, you know? It's not the exact same path, but I, I respect every path. You know, we're all trying to get enlightened, but again, it's really about the journey, you know? It's really about getting to, like, you don't focus so much on the destination. But again, that's this is my teachings to you. I don't want to say it, but, you know, this... There's a reason that there's more than one path. I'm giving you guys the advice now. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm done. I'm done. Path, also known as the Bodhisattva path, is open to everyone. It sees Bodhisattvas as being compassionate individuals who yes. put off enlightenment for the sake of helping others. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Therefore, in oh, my gosh. I've, I've put off my own personal enlightenment for you guys for so long. You know, I, again, I could have the light behind me right now, but I'm making sure to give you guys more knowledge, you know, with these, all these videos. I'm, oh my gosh, the things I do for you, the things I do for you guys, it's unmatched throughout all of YouTube. I, nobody works this hard. Mahayana Buddhism, there are lots of bodhisattvas many of whom are understood to be residing in higher realms. Mm -hmm. So Mahayana mm -hmm. Buddhists often pray to bodhisattvas and ask them for help. One example of a bodhisattva is this guy, often called the Laughing Buddha or Fat Buddha. His real name is actually Bude, and he was a monk who lived around a thousand years ago. But here's the important thing. I know we've all seen, I feel like we've all seen him. Most people probably associate him with being the Buddha, uh, the Buddha, but he's not. He, you know, he, he's Budai. That's a whole nother guy. This is Honda versus Hyundai all over again. Budai 
and the Buddha are not the same person. Yeah, Buddha. I'm sorry. His name is Buddha. He is the Buddha. They are different, yet people confuse them. They're completely different. The Buddha is Siddhartha Gautama, the founder of Buddhism, yes. who became a Buddha over 2,000 years ago. In contrast, Buddha is a bodhisattva on his way to becoming a Buddha. Some think that he is Maitreya, that future Buddha that I mentioned earlier. All of this brings up the question, are there gods in Buddhism? Well, it kind of depends on your definition of a god. Although Buddhism is often said to be an atheistic religion, in Mahayana Buddhism at least, a bodhisattva certainly seems to be something a little bit similar to a god. Maybe not the omnipotent sort of god that Abrahamic religions talk about, but mm -hmm. some sort of spiritual being for sure. Okay. In Theravada Buddhism, this is less true. For example... So I would imagine it being more like the angel situation where, I mean, maybe once you pass, you become a, like after you reach enlightenment, you would become more like a, a spirit because you're no longer being put into like reincarnation. So your spirit would just be there, I guess, like helping other people on their path to enlightenment. But that's just me. But again, guys, that's why I'm that's why we're on different paths, guys. Example, you might see a Theravada Buddhist standing in front of a statue of the Buddha with their hands together. But in this case, they are not actually worshiping Buddha as a god. Mm -hmm. Instead, they are simply showing respect or using the Buddha's form as an aid to meditation. Okay, let's now go back to the family tree chart. There are three particular sub-branches of each. Okay, okay. I, I can't anymore. This is crazy to me. Uh, Diggy Gabra? Uh, uh, Skyclad? What is this? This has been just slightly on off to the left the whole time. It has got my attention multiple times. I, I, I want... He probably already went through this, and maybe I could just watch my own videos over to, like, understand it. But, like, it is right there. Like, right there. <laughs> Why? Is this... Like, what is... Yeah, it's such a distraction to me. I'm Jim easily Mahayana, distracted. That I am easily distracted. I don't know if you guys knew this, but like that right there is like a huge. It might as well just have like a neon sign over it. It is a old man with his shirt off. I am too easily distracted for that. <laughs> I'd like to point out there are actually many more than these, but these three tend to be the most popular. The first is. Chan Buddhism, known as Zen Buddhism in okay. Japan. It is particularly popular in the West and mostly focused on meditation. Then there's Pure Land Buddhism, where the focus is trying to get reborn in a special purified land, where it's then easier to achieve enlightenment. Okay. The most popular Pure Land in Pure Land Buddhism is the one formed by a Buddha named Amitabha. Finally, there's Tiantai, known as Tendai in Japan, and Chiante in Korea. It focuses on the Lotus Sutra that I mentioned earlier, which teaches that all paths eventually lead to the one Bodhisattva path. Okay, I now want to turn our attention to Tibetan Buddhism. Back in the early days of Mahayana, there was another movement that split off, known as Vajrayana. But like Mahayana, this was not a separate school of Buddhism, but rather a movement that impacted several schools. One school that took on Vajrayana ideas was the Mula Sarvastivada school, which was probably a branch of the similarly named Sarvastivada school. It okay. eventually spread north to Tibet and Bhutan, which is where it is mostly found today. Tibetan Buddhism differs from other forms of Buddhism in that it incorporates far more esoteric practices, such as chanting, reciting incantations, and mm. making geometric patterns called mandalas to help induce trances. The most famous Tibetan Buddhist is, of course, the Dalai Lama, who yeah. is seen as being a sort of figurehead for the Tibetan people. He is actually the leader of just one sect of Tibetan Buddhism, of which there are currently four. However, what? his sect, known as the Gelug, or Yellow Hat School, is the largest one. He is referred to as the 14th Dalai Lama, 
because the belief is that he is the reincarnation of a man named Gedan Drupa, who died in 1474, but continues to be reborn on Earth. In turn, all of the Dalai Lamas are said to be incarnations of a bodhisattva called Avalokitesvara. Now, before I go... Hmm. Now, that's interesting. Because, like, once you reach enlightenment, don't you stop doing the, you know, reincarnation? So, like, if they stop doing reincarnation, why did that one guy who reached it, you know, that level be decide, like, no, I'm actually going to keep being reincarnated? Except I'm going to know I'm reincarnated every time. Like, I'm, I'm just going to be... Like, I feel like Bo like the Buddha should have done that, right? Like, if anybody, like, well, he should have been the one who's like, you know what, I've already reached it, but I'm going to keep coming back. You know, I don't know. That's my only question. I'm not, I'm not trying to throw a dent in it. You know, if you are a Buddhist, again, if you are a Tibetan Buddhist, I am uh, just asking a question here, guys. I'm just, I'm just throwing out the question. Of a bodhisattva called Avalokitesvara. <laughs> Now, before I go, I want to briefly mention Jainism, which is the other religion that can be traced back to the Shramana movement. Hey. It was founded by a man named Mahavira, who, as you can see here, is often depicted as looking quite similar to the Buddha. Now, I've heard of Jainism, and or Jainism, um, from what I've heard, is similar to Christianity. Maybe he even went over this in the uh, Christian Denominations video. This looks very familiar. And if we're going to be judging symbols here, uh, maybe it's that time again, guys. If you were going to choose between this Hinduism symbol here, this Jainism symbol, and then this Buddhist symbol. In fact, which one are you choosing? Me personally, and this is just me personally. I'm going Jainism, Hinduism, Buddhism. And now, hear me out, guys. Hear me out. This is a really cool tattoo. This would be the coolest tattoo out of the three. Now, you can fight me over whether this wheel or this symbol here would be cooler, but we know this one, like, visually, optically, in your, in your eyeball, this looks, this looks, like, creative and impressive. You saw that on, like, an arm or something like that. Like, ask Kyrie. He knows about that. But this one here... I feel like also would be really cool. Now, I don't know how many people of Hinduism, Hinduist beliefs would get the tattoos. I would honestly, I would say the same for all three of these. I don't know which one of these people would even be okay with having tattoos. I feel like most religions would probably tell you not to get a tattoo, but I am here to tell you if you were to get a tattoo, it should be this one, then it should be this one, Hinduism one, and then it should be the Buddhist one. Now, here's the cool thing about the Buddhist one. Even though I placed a third, you can put it in so many places. This could be on an elbow. This could be on, this could be on a hand. This could be on a knee. This could be a lot of places. Your back, your shoulder. You know, it's versatile. The Hinduism, I feel like it really works well somewhere on like a hand or like maybe like a chest you know maybe on like a leg area you know i wouldn't go for back on that one you know i want to make sure it's somewhere out front where i could see it other people could see it same with jainism it could be everywhere or you know i feel like it really goes well on the arm or like somewhere on arms i feel like it's mostly an arm thing but I still like it. So you guys vote. Which one, <laughs> which tattoo would be the best for you? The two teachers lived around the same time, with Mahavira being the older of the two. Whereas the Buddha was born in Kasala, Mahavira was born in Vrigi. One That'd be so fun. I'm sorry, guys. I know this is random. It would be so funny if people watch this video and it's like, oh, this is the first video I ever watched of this guy. And then they're just like... This guy goes on so many random rants about everything. <laughs> like, <laughs> somebody out there is going to be watching this for the first time, and they're going to be like, why did he just go on a tattoo rant uh, between Jainism, Hinduism, and Buddhism? Three people who probably would not want you to get a tattoo of their symbols. Why did he do that? And then I will say... 
back to the video. Of the key features of the Jain religion is nonviolence, and therefore most Jains are vegetarians. Today, They're doing Jainism it. is They're talking about it. They're talking about these guys. I told you this was so distracting in my head just now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Thank you, Matt. I am thankful. Smaller than Buddhism. And really, there are only two main branches. The larger one is called Svetambara, which means white clad, because its monks wear white robes. Okay. Note the face mask also. Jains have been wearing face masks long before the current pandemic. Nice. This helps prevent sacred items from being contaminated. The other branch of Jainism is called Digambara, meaning sky-clad. This is because the male monks in this sect wear no clothes at all. A testament to the fact that they want as few earthly possessions as possible. Okay, I don't know about being called sky-clad if you're just going to be like naked. Be like the skin clad or something, or uh, the no clothes clad. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, man. The land clad, the earth clad. Oh my God, I don't know. Okay, so that was a look at the family tree of Buddhist denominations. Eventually, wow. I plan to combine all of the denomination charts I've made so far into one large world religions family Whoa. tree poster. So keep an eye out for that. Guys, keep an eye out for that, because that may be in my background soon, you know, because I like to support YouTubers. And if you also like to support YouTubers, then you should check out my merch link, because this is sponsored by myself. Uh, look at that. There's a symbol on the back. It's also got the thing, uh, the symbol on it. It's got it in the same place that I have the actual tattoo, so you can be similar to me. You can follow my path more about Buddhism, I suggest you check out Blinkist using the link in the description or pinned comment. Finally, I want to announce that I've activated the join button on this channel. This Woo! allows you to become a channel member, which is slightly different from being Woo! just a subscriber. Subscribing to the channel is free and will always be free. However, becoming a channel member gives you a few extra perks. The most notable one being that you get Woo! priority replies from me, which means that if you ask a question in the comment section, I will definitely reply. Okay, I hope you Hey guys, that's a good channel perk. You know, I'm almost at 500 subscribers myself and you could be one of those 500. And once I get 500 subscribers, I will also think about enabling the membership program, which then you will become a member and I will have my own special emojis and I will uh, also read your comments and reply back to them. Now, I already know what most of you are saying, but you already watch her, look at our comments, and you already reply to most of them. And then I'm gonna be like, I'm gonna keep doing that. I'm gonna do it even more. I'm gonna reply two times for every one comment that you guys give me. I am not gonna keep on to that. I may do that to, for some people. Who knows? G almost guaranteed two replies if I am being serious right now, which I don't know if I am. Either way, become a member. Enjoy today's video. I've got one more coming about denominations, but I'm not going to tell you what kind of denominations Ooh. yet. See if you can guess in the comments. Thanks for watching. Man, that was another great video, guys. Uh, what do you think that the next denomination he's going to go over is going to be? I have a feeling that it's going to be something, hmm, I want to say Native American. I'm, I don't know why I'm throwing it out there. I don't know what the religion is called. I don't know anything about it. I'm just throwing out a, a comment. You guys, it's up to you now to reply and say what you think it would be in, you know, in my comment here. So do that, guys. Uh, this was a fun video, man. I love these. And you know what this means is I now have to go on a slight, like, um, a slight path of learning more about Buddhism because this can't be the only source of knowledge, even though this was an extremely useful source. Uh, it was like he made a chart and then the chart was useful. It's almost as if this guy makes super useful charts. Wow. 
wow i love this guy he i love his charts i love the videos uh they're all incredible uh, but yeah, this is a really good time to get back into making more of the religious videos. Again, I do want to get more into like the Christian videos, uh, get back into like all the Abrahamic religions, all the uh, non-Abrahamic religions as well. I want to make sure everyone, every rare out there gets a view. Um, and then, yeah, I, I just love learning about this stuff, guys. And if you like watching me learn or being on this journey and path with me, uh, if you're like, man, you know who does some of the best rants randomly throughout a video for no freaking reason at all? This guy. I want you to hit that subscribe button. I want you to hit that like button. I want you to comment down below. Uh, I want you to go to this merch shop and then buy a shirt and you can be like me. Uh, I want you to have a great day, guys. I love you. Bye.